You're listening to Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in once more. Well, it's official out of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that assistance that's being made available to agricultural producers in the wake of the trade tariff situation has now been firmed up and formalized, and the details are out. And uh, the program to be administered now very soon by the Farm Service Agency offices throughout Kansas. We've invited over from the state FSA headquarters, the the state director of the Farm Service Agency, David Shim. And right at the outset, David, want to point out that this program was put together on the QT and a great lot of work went into it, right? Yeah, there really was. And there was a lot of focus within the program, uh, especially from an implementation strategy and being able to get out there and help our farmers out there to make it simple and as easy as possible for our producers to get in there and to sign up for FSA as a uh, USDA agent to be able to implement it. And obviously, bottom line is get these checks into the farmer's hands who, you know, when you look at it, you know, roughly almost 40% of these tariffs have targeted ag. So obviously, our ag economy has been hit. And so with that in mind, there's been a lot of work to get to where we're at now. And where we're at now, really three programs under the entire umbrella, but the one we'll talk of today is the one that is directly applicable to producers. It's called the Market Facilitation Program. And what are the basic components of this, David? Yeah, absolutely. And like like you said, there is, there's three components. You know, there's some uh, food programs around roughly $1.2 billion, some ag trade programs, you know, to help uh, facilitate that trade, you know, about $200 million. But like you said, the lion's share of it, four point seven. $7 billion is targeted toward this market facilitation program, which basically is encompassing five crops and two different uh, livestock programs to be able to come in there and basically have offsetting to what the impacts that these tariffs have had on these various commodities that we have out there. And by name, those commodities, corn, dairy, hogs, grain sorghum, soybeans, wheat, and cotton. Those would be the ones listed for this assistance, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. You know, it's uh, those rates, as many people have already heard, wheat is at 14 cents a bushel, milo is the 86 cents a bushel, soybeans $1.65, corn is a one penny per bushel, cotton is six cents per pound. On the uh, livestock side, with the pork, it's uh, $8 per pig, and then with the dairy, it's 12 cents per hundred weight. Staying on the crop side for the moment here, you mentioned the payment rates. How will those payments be issued then? On what basis using those rates will those be determined? Well, what the, what the program has been developed around is, is going to be based upon actual 2018 crop production for those various uh, five commodities there. When those payment rates or factors are then multiplied by what a producer's actual total production is, it will then be multiplied uh, by 50%. And within this, this is targeted as a first initial payment or, or facilitation program to be going out to producers to handle, you know, obviously the impact that the tariffs have had. And then we'll be looking at in the future of possibly a second half of payment, depending upon what happens with uh, various trade negotiations and tariffs. So that is pending that second payment, but the first payment go round is definitive. It will happen. Absolutely is definitive. It is based upon those rates I said. So again, you know, again, when we talk about simplicity for the uh, farmer standpoint, it's simply going to be those payment rates, you know, multiplied by a farmer's total production for the year times that factor of 50 percent. Again, that first half uh, there, and, and that's what a producer uh, can be expecting to receive. In the advent of that second possible payment, is there any established timeline for that, or is that free-floating at this point, David? Again, those things are being evaluated, and, and as we all know, uh, trade situations, uh, tariff situations can be changing almost on a weekly basis, you know, with uh, additional retaliatory uh, tariffs being imposed on China. Uh, but good news, obviously, uh, sounds like we're on the trade uh, movement front dealing with Mexico and having some additional trade there. So those things are obviously something that can uh, be looked at in the future. But what we are definitely expecting is that somewhere around that first part of December, uh, we will be able to announce a second uh, payment rate if it's applicable. And again, it may not be applicable. We may be able to get these, these trade disputes resolved and taken care of. Or if they don't, we may be looking at some different type of rate to try to, again, help our producers out there. So 
As producers have already harvested, say, their wheat crop, come this Tuesday, September the 4th, when this program is formally opened, those producers can come right in and start the ball rolling on that, correct? Absolutely correct. And that's one thing I definitely want to highlight uh, here today, Eric, is that uh, within these, again, it's based upon your total production there for your commodities, for your crops there. Uh, Again, here within the state of Kansas, uh, our wheat state here, that we have all of our wheat already harvested there. Those producers can come in with their total production. Again, it's it's, it's based upon their total production of wheat and apply for that. Uh, They'll be able to certify what their production was, and then those checks will uh, start the process of being cut and getting into those producers' hands. Uh, Just briefly on the livestock side of it, the pork or the hogs are based upon an inventory of August 1st, and, you know, they will be able to come in, uh, provide the evidence of inventory uh, of those animals on August 1st, and again, that rate would be $8 a pig. And then, again, the dairy would be $0.12 a hundred weight times their MPP, their margin protection program under the dairy program. And, again, all those factors then come back into 50% of that for a first half of payment. To clarify, for those producers who have row crops out, fall harvested grains, there's no rush to come in and apply for this quite yet, you say. They don't have to pre-commit or anything like that at this point? That's exactly right. Uh, Our sign-up for this program here, as you referenced, starts the 4th here, and uh, it'll run clear until January 15th. That's for sign-up for the program then. Obviously, with some of these, you know, for example, cotton, there may be situations where ginning is not done yet by the January 15th date of this next year. So they'll still have opportunity, obviously, to come in, improve production, and receive payment on that. But for the crops that are not harvested yet, and obviously right now we're looking at the milo, the soybeans, the corn, the cotton out there, no checks, nothing will be cut for those producers in there until they have 100% of their crop harvested there. So again, like I mentioned earlier, with the wheat and the livestock, those producers, they can start coming in, signing up for the program, and uh, being able to get those checks into their hands. For those producers of those other crops that are not harvested, just give it a chance here. Let us work through the uh, the producers now that can receive the checks, and then once you get those crops harvested, come in by all means. And they have until January the 15th to take care of any of this business, so it's a pretty open-ended opportunity. Absolutely. Like I said, sign up. Make sure you get signed up by that January 15th deadline there, and then uh, once you get signed up, obviously when 100% of that crop is harvested, come in there and, and show us what the production is, and then we'll be able to get uh, that check into your hand basically almost immediately. There is a cap for how much one can earn under the MFP total. Is that correct? That is correct. And so kind of what the, uh, the I guess we'd say, a good news aspect for producers is that we do have a 125,000 cap set up for our other farm title programs here. But under this MFP program, there is a 125,000 cap set up for the crop side of it, and then there is a separate 125,000 payment cap uh, set up for livestock side of it. And that MFP cap does not include any payments that might be coming the producer's way for their participation in the agricultural risk coverage program or price loss coverage. That's an important detail here. Absolutely, exactly right. That is a separate payment cap. Uh, These payment caps of the 125 for the crop on MFP and for the livestock, there's two separate caps there for each of those, and they are absolutely separate from the ARC or PLC cap. Very good. Point being, your offices are inundated with a number of things, uh, livestock support programs and otherwise, so you want to spread that workload out as best you can, David, with producers' cooperation. Absolutely, and a lot of this information can be gotten at uh, farmers.gov slash MFP. Producers can access that. For our producers out there that have Level 2 EAUTH or would like to go in and get Level 2 EAUTH, they can actually go in and sign up for this form that we will be having for the market facilitation program online and getting a majority of that done online. We hope to have that up and going here by mid-September. As, uh, as always with technology, there's challenges there. Uh, as you mentioned there, we've got a lot of other programs going on here with the state. County offices out there that are dealing with, you, like you said, the livestock forage programs, 
uh, some emergency haying and grazing on CRP. So they're pretty busy there right now, and we definitely want our producers that uh, can go in there that have 100% of their wheat harvested, that have the, the hogs, that have the dairy to get in there, go ahead and sign up. But for those other producers that you don't have all that crop harvested, wait till you get that crop harvested and then come into those offices. That way it gives them that opportunity to be able to get caught up and, and ready to serve you. You bet. Well, the Market Facilitation Program is now open for business as of, again, this Tuesday, September the 4th. It'll continue as an opportunity for you producers through January the 15th of 2019. Your local FSA personnel can answer questions for you, as always. And, David, thanks for the overview right here. Always appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. He is the State Director of the Farm Service Agency and reporting here on the newly announced details of that program under the package of tariff trade relief, which was announced by the USDA just a few days ago. David Shim with us on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Well, our guest now is being besieged yet with more calls from growers about insect activity in row crops and grain sorghum and soybeans in specific. And he has some input that will be useful for you producers in as far as responding to that insect pressure. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Starting with grain sorghum, Jeff, and something we've spoken of before, the sorghum headworm, and it is quite prolific out there, you say, right now. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me, Eric. Mm-hmm. Despite the heat and the humidity, the insects are doing fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, we have talked about sorghum for a while now this summer, mainly with chinch bugs, and chinch bugs are still really doing well. I think we're kind of overlooking chinch bugs because they're down around the base of the plant, and we have some pests higher up in the plant that are more visible and causing more problems. But I just like everybody to remember the chinch bugs are still there. They're still sucking the juice out of the plant. They're still weakening the stalks. So just be aware that we still may see some premature lodging later on. But you're right, in the last probably two or three weeks, with the earlier planted sorghums that are into the flowering stage now, uh, we've started to see a, a lot of corn earworms, soybean podworms, sorghum headworm, whatever you want to call it. It's the same species of insect feeding on the marketable product. And that's really kind of the crux of the problem. And in the last two or three weeks, they're really increasing. So we've been out in north central Kansas the last few days. There's very small worms, which indicates they're just hatching. There's moths flying around, which indicates they're still laying eggs. And there's larvae that are probably half way through their developmental stage. So that means they're going to be around a while? Yes. Now, they will feed probably during the flowering to soft dose stage of sorghum. That's when it's most vulnerable. Uh, They can still feed later if they're already there, but primarily the moths don't lay eggs past those stages. So uh, what you said is exactly right. The moths will feed for, again, depending upon the temperature, 10 days to 14 days. The vulnerable stage of the sorghum is from flowering to uh, soft dough, which is depending upon the variety, maybe around 14 days or a little longer. So, And if they coincide, you can get 5% loss per worm per plant. And most of the fields that we're looking at, they're averaging over two worms per head. What we do is go out and check several different places, 10 plants, several different places in the field, and get an average of your infestation level, how many worms per head. Then you can just, it's very simple to go get the market price of sorghum for that day, call up your applicator or see what it costs you to put on your own application, figure out if it's worth controlling the head worms. The nice thing about it, the headworms are right up there in the head. Most of the ones we've put out trials for over the years or I've ever seen, they're really easily controlled. So you do get pretty good results, but what you want to do is make sure you get out and check it right now because they're pretty small. Uh, some of the fields we've looked at in the last couple of days, they're first and second instars. And that means 
when you take the head and shake it in the bucket, you're going to get a lot of, you know, florets and other kinds of stuff that makes it difficult to see these little tiny worms. But if you wait a minute, they will start to move. And you can see what, what's in there because the small ones really are well camouflaged and hard to see. But they're going to feed for two weeks. Those are the ones that even though you don't see any white cracked eaten grain now, you're going to in the next seven to ten days. So if you do decide to put out an insecticide application, you know, you want to do it while they're small before you've lost very much uh, in the way of yield. One of the considerations that everybody's considering now is, you know, the sugarcane aphid. That's and the complicating factor here, right, it, as yes, far as it, treating the headworm? It can be. There's two things now with the sugarcane aphid. First, in the later planted sorghums that are just getting into the world stage, there are quite a few corn leaf aphids. Those are the aphids that are pretty much in the world. They're a little dark gray, dark green color. They're relatively easily to distinguish from sugarcane aphids. They get in the world. They do produce a lot of, of uh, honeydew. That's one of the questions also. Say, well, all this honeydew has to come from sugarcane aphid. Nope. Aphids produce honeydew, and corn leaf aphids can produce a lot, even so much when they're in the world that the head can't extend out. Now, it's usually not a field-wide problem, but they can produce a lot of honeydew. But the nice thing about corn leaf aphids, over the last month, um, they have attracted and held a lot of beneficials. So a lot of the sorghum fields that have had pretty good infestations of corn leaf aphids, they have pretty good populations of green lace wings and a lot of the little wasps that can parasitize the aphids. And, you know, some of the, a lot of surfeit flies out there that feed on the aphids. So there's a pretty good beneficial population complex also in the fields that have had corn leaf aphids. That bodes well if we start getting sugarcane aphids especially as we get these southern breezes, um, they're migrating in all the time. And they will for the next month or so. They will keep coming in. So the later planted sorghums are still going to be at risk for a while. The problem is if you spray a conventional insecticide, a synthetic pyrethroid, for instance, for headworms, you're going to do a good job of killing the headworms, but you're probably also going to do a pretty good job of killing the beneficials, especially in the top third of the plant. If you use an airplane, do aerial application, which probably most are going to do, you're going to get a good job for the most part of cleaning off the head feeding worms. Uh, you're going to penetrate the canopy, but it's only going to be really to about a third of the way down. A lot of the aphids will be on the underneath sides of the leaves, you know, midway down in the plant. So really, these contact insecticides are not going to contact the aphids. So those colonies are going to increase but you're going to have killed the beneficials that might be there searching out to help control these aphids. Plus, they're going to continue to migrate in or blow in on the winds. So as soon as the top part of the plant's insecticide residual uh, starts to dissipate, those aphids are going to continue to come in, and they're parthenogenic, so they're going to reproduce very quickly, whereas the beneficials are going to be gone. So it's going to take a lot longer for those beneficials to build up if they even do this year. So that's the consideration. There are some products out there that are easier on the beneficials. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're considering headworm treatment, you need to go to your local applicator or your local supplier and determine which products are easier on the beneficials. And like I said, there are some. Usually they're a little bit higher priced, but that's a consideration you have to make right now. You can kill, clean off, whatever you want to call it, the headworms, but if we do get sugarcane aphids in treatable populations or in populations that may impact yield later on, you're probably going to have to look at another treatment or another spray. And again, there's some sprays that kill aphids pretty well, but they don't actually do that much on headworms. So like you said, it's kind of a, the age-old problem. You know, I got two different types of insects, and they're going to feed different ways, but they're still going to impact my yield. So what do I do? You need to study the situation closely before you make a decision. Well, you have a known loss with the headworms, 5% per worm per head. So as the late plantum sorghum starts to head out, get out and check that then because we got at least one more generation of corn earworms coming on or sorghum headworms or soybean podworms, uh, whatever you want to call them, because when another 
seven to ten days when these things pupate, the, the, most of the generation that's out there now, they're going to crawl down to the plant and they're going to pupate uh, for four or five days. And they're going to go around and lay eggs. The eggs are going to hatch in four or five days. And they're going to move to the late planted sorghum. Remember, between after it gets to soft dough, they're really not going to affect it that much. Uh, so it's just between flowering and soft dough. But the later planted sorghum is still going to be in that stage two to three weeks from now. So that's what you need to consider right now. A quick look at soybeans here, and uh, there is defoliation in some stands, which has growers concerned about what insect might be at work there, Jeff. Yes, we are getting uh, late-season defoliators with grasshoppers, some green clover worms, and woolly bears. The thing is, a lot of the beans are in the mid-reproductive stages, you know, like R5, R6, R7, which means the beans are pretty much already, you know, in the pods. So you want to make sure you know what stage of growth your, your beans are in. Because unless these defoliators are actually defoliating up to 50% or 60%, they're probably not going to affect the yield from now on all that much. As long as you're not over about 50% defoliation in those mid-reproductive stages, you know, you'd probably be better off not treating those. But again, they're right up there on top of the plant. So if you do decide to treat, you know, they're easy to kill usually. I mean, use the cheapest product that's available that's registered for control of whatever it is, green clover worms or um, woolly bear caterpillars, and it should clean them up pretty nicely so you don't have to worry about it. We have gotten some calls about soybean aphids in the last couple of weeks, and they have not materialized or mounted anything yet, but they're still out there. Again, they're still migrating in, but soybean aphids, unlike the sugarcane aphid and sorghum, the soybean aphid likes cooler weather. It does better in cooler weather. So as long as the temperatures are in the 90s, those populations are probably not going to expand. But sugarcane aphid, since it's a subtropical or tropical aphid, they will. They do like get along better in warmer climates or warmer temperatures. Jeff, we appreciate the overview as always. Thanks. Yes, my pleasure, Eric. Thank you. That's a quick glimpse to insect activity of note for you grain sorghum and soybean growers. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. We'll return with more after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. Concessions made by Mexico in the negotiations to update NAFTA with the U.S. were labeled as major by Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland as she came out of a session with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer in Washington. That deal cut by the U.S. and Mexico on auto rules of content and a requirement that auto parts be made by workers earning at least $16 per hour were called significant by Freeland. She said that these concessions are going to be valuable for workers in Canada and the U.S. who have been concerned for some time about their jobs going to lower wage jurisdictions, as she put it. Now, Friedland was to meet with Mexican Economy Secretary Aldefonso Guajardo late last evening and then return for another session with Lighthizer today, but did not say whether that session would include Guajardo. Meantime, on the trade front, India has the ability to capture market share in China in products where China has placed tariffs on U.S. agricultural products like corn, cotton, wheat, and sorghum. This according to a study by India's Commerce Ministry. It says that the retaliatory tariffs have provided a window of opportunity for enhancing India's exports to China. The purpose of that analysis was to identify such lines. India has additional duty concessions via the Asia 
Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement. However, this paper also points out that durum wheat, corn, and grain sorghum are some of the products India exports to countries around the world except for China. The report indicated that corn is a specific interest for India as it exported $143 million worth during the marketing year 2017-2018. Most of the money allocated to that USDA program to help farmers hurt by the tariffs will go for those direct payments to producers. But there is a considerable amount of money for purchases of food products, for feeding programs. We've more on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. One part of the three-part USDA plan to help farmers hurt by tariffs is designed to purchase commodities unfairly targeted by the unjustified retaliation. And that would help keep prices up for farmers. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue calls it the Food Purchase and Distribution Program. Undersecretary Greg Ibach will head up that program. The USDA normally buys food products for the school lunch program and other feeding programs. This will be above and beyond those purchases and not designed to displace those commodities. Ibach says in this case, the focus will be on those high high-quality, high-value commodities that were destined for the foreign marketplace that uh, was damaged most by those illegal tariffs. So instead of buying regular oranges, for example... We're going to be buying extra fancy oranges that were destined for the Chinese marketplace before the tariffs were uh, put in place. Total purchases for this program for all products authorized up to $1.2 billion. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Foot and mouth disease is a significant standing threat to the U.S. livestock industry. Todd Domer reports here that industry sources are now pushing hard to address the risk through new federal legislation. A coalition of ag groups recently submitted a letter to Farm Bill negotiators on the conference committee expressing the importance of a vaccine bank for animal diseases in the U.S. In the past, The U.S. strategy for an FMD outbreak relied on the depopulation of affected cattle. After extensive study and discussion, regulatory authorities and the livestock sector now support managing an outbreak through vaccination. The current U.S. bank, located at Plum Island, New York, only contains enough vaccine for a small, confined FMD outbreak. Preparation of a ready-to-administer vaccine currently would take weeks. By the time vaccines were widely administered, the entire U.S. beef industry would be in economic and animal welfare chaos. Foot and mouth vaccine production is limited worldwide, with no excess capacity to produce the millions of doses it would take in the event of a large-scale outbreak in the U.S. An FMD outbreak would immediately close all beef export markets, which have supported beef demand in recent years, Estimates are beef export losses alone within the first year would be about $6.34 billion. I'm Todd Domer. And an announcement coming out earlier this morning, Kansas State University and TopCon Agriculture will be collaborating to develop tools and systems to advance precision agriculture in support of producers. TopCon Agriculture is aiming to develop product concepts through gathering requirements, drafting specifications, and conducting market research and testing products in the laboratory, on the university farms, and around the state using K-State Research and Extension and Agricultural Experiment State facilities. The interim dean of the College of Agriculture and director of K-State Research and Extension, Ernie Minton, said that researchers at K-State are interested in working with the company because of its broad interdisciplinary approach and involvement in many areas highly relevant to Kansas producers. Ernie saying that precision agriculture offers new tools that will help producers prosper as they work to feed the world's growing population. K-State emphasizes industry collaboration and has seen an 80 percent increase in the number of industry-funded projects in the last five years. K-State successfully pursuing research and service agreements with a number of industry partners. The research collaborations established with TopCon are the beginning of a mutually beneficial partnership. Looking forward to expanding a relationship to advance innovation in precision agriculture in Kansas and beyond. Those are the comments of Rebecca Robinson, the Director of Economic Development at the Kansas State University Institute for Commercialization. 
One last reminder about those K-State Water Technology Field Days still taking place. There are two more on the slate coming up. I'll make that three more coming up uh, tomorrow in Scott County and Wichita County. And then the 31st Friday in Ford County. Touch base with your local extension office for details on those. To listen to Agriculture Today anytime you'd like to, the podcast version that is, we're reminding you to go to agtoday.net. Or using your podcast app on your mobile device, you can type in the search keywords, Agriculture Today Kansas, and you can find the program right there. You just tap the subscribe button, and brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device every weekday. So once more, go to agtoday.net for the podcast proper. If you'd like to have that fed to you on your mobile device directly, type in those search keywords, Agriculture Today Kansas, and the program will pop up once you subscribe to the service brand new episodes every day. You are listening to Agriculture Today. In a moment, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. Stop, look, and listen. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Mr. Full Moon, they make a great, mysterious show, which I enjoy. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. If you're like me, you look for color in the garden. Right now, they are the white mushrooms, which exploded after the last rainy period. I have some very large ones standing near the old decomposed tree trunk, an apple tree, which died. A few years ago, I kicked it over, carried the last remaining stump away, and cut it up. And it has gone up in smoke. However, the slowly decomposing roots and debris provide ample organic matter and the large white fungi responded. With the full moon, they make a great mysterious show which I enjoy. The rain, tight soil, and plenty of organic matter will bring them on. Of course, some people will see them as bad or even ugly intrusions on what is supposed to be a perfect green but oh so dull long. Sorry, that's how I feel. One of the chemical companies has material you can spray on the lawn, and it gives control for up to four weeks, so your lawn will stay green. But just think, these large mushrooms are like jewelry, especially if they pop up in a circle or semicircle. But even as a grouping with different sizes, they become a temporary special ornament. I have a few with four to six inch flat tops. Some are rounded, but they are smaller. All are creamy white. Some of the very large ones have started to shrivel up. They can't take the heat. On overcast days, you see them pop up on the lawn, especially if the soil is compacted and rainwater can't quickly soak into the ground. But here at home, I have a large planting spread out of Finca Minor with its glossy leaves which reflect in the moonlight and then spreading out from the old remains of the tree stump these growing gorgeous fungi. When the moon is out and full like it is now, it's a gorgeous picture, just a different garden picture you did not have to work at. Pruning up the tree some more would bring in more light, and that would give viewer of the white mushrooms. So I will not prune up the lower branches. Being junipers, they have lost their needles anyway. Also, with the feeders around, I see the birds quickly hop from branch to branch or perch. 
Even squirrels lay in the narrow branch crotches in the shade and catch the cool breeze. I looked for my mushroom book as I wrote my thoughts down, but I couldn't find it. The question is, are these fungi poisonous? I noticed none of the wandering animals, raccoons or squirrels, had nibbled on the white rims or balloons, and I did not pick any to bring them into the house and give them to Anneke to add to the salad. Which reminds me, we should know more. A German friend told me how during the war, when they had little food, his grandmother would go out into the forest to gather nature's edibles to help provide. It was the old grandmother who knew. Many years ago, I bought a then popular book, Stalking the Wild Asparagus, by Ewell Gibbons. It's a field guide. I pulled it off my shelves and read a chapter on mushrooms. I reread Raw Mushroom Salad. I'm sure it is very healthy if you know what you pick. A few years ago, I did run into a big patch of morals on the farm, which I shared with some dear friends. That was probably a big mistake. But what are friends for? Anyway, I've enjoyed the large white mushrooms flowering now with the bright light of the full moon on a clear night. Soon, it will be gone, and the spores will be dormant, waiting for another opportunity with rain, compacted soil, organic matter, and the damp weather to return. A few times you see a complete fairy ring, where the exploding mushrooms form a complete circle. The circle can be small or larger. The fun part of that is to share the fairy tale with children or grandchildren. Just let your own imagination take over and tell a story, your story, how the small gnomes and the elves will come out and dance. When tired, they take a seat on a mushroom. With all the electronic stuff children play with, a homegrown story can be great fun. I remember walking the farm with the then small grandkids, some I would carry on my shoulders, softly singing a song as we walked a path or trail. Then, when I would see a hollow tree trunk, I would spin a tail. But you know, if you walked quietly with your eyes and ears wide open, you don't even have to make tails up, even though that's fun. But the tale or true story is there. I remember the time I walked the pass, passing a large hollow tree, and a bobcat crawled out and ran along a long horizontal branch. What made it so striking is that the sun was shining along that branch and lit up the gorgeous fur of the cat. In my mind, I still see the small cat sure-footed. Tonight, I'll step out once more when the big moon is out and take a look at the white mushrooms, the reproductive part of the fungi that live in the soil. Generally, the fungi are just working on the ground, breaking down the organic matter. There's no need to buy chemicals to fight the colorful growth. When the sun comes out and the soil dries, they will shrivel up. In a few days, you will have forgotten about them, or you might just miss them blooming in the night with the full moon. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas.